Hello and welcome to Reinforcement Learning Exercise 4. This is Max Schenke speaking and today we will be dealing with Monte Carlo methods. In this exercise we are making use of the racetrack environment that hopefully all of you were able to finish in homework number one. In case you were not able to finish the racetrack environment for the homework we included a racetrack environment in this um, exercise but uh, please feel free and try to use your own racetrack environment in order to test uh, how good your programming skills have evolved. So let's have at first a look at the course the racetrack environment will be using in this exercise. It's built in this function and it will look like this. Um, we called it the U-turn course because you will perform a U-turn with a car. This is the starting line and this is the goal line. So what the task is, is to move the car around this corner and um, get to the finish line. If you have uh, written the environment yourself, you're probably familiar with the environment physics, but I will um, revisit them anyway. So what happens here? Um, the car will be starting on the starting line in a random position. So um, here are three fields on the starting line and we do not know uh, in which of these fields the car will start. Uh, then we can accelerate the car in any um, of the um, main directions, uh, so north, south, east, west, um, but also um, half directions, so also um, northeast, for example. Most importantly, what we are controlling is the acceleration of the car and not the speed. So what does it mean if we are going at one speed unit into the east direction, for example, uh, and we accelerate by one uh, into the, um, the east direction, then we are going at two speed units into the east direction. And um, the same um, applies for braking. Um, if we are going at two speed uh, units into the east direction and we are um, braking, so um, applying one uh, acceleration unit into the west direction, um, then this means that we are um, going in the next step at one speed unit into the east direction. Because of this we need to pay a little attention when going into this turn at higher speed because the car also needs to brake in order to avoid collision with a wall. If collision with any of the walls in this course happens, the car will be um, placed back onto the starting line again and will have to start over. The reward di distribution in this problem is time-based. You lose one point of reward for every time step that it takes to reach the goal line so that um, it is encouraged to go to the finish line as fast as possible. That should be everything about the environment for the moment, so let's have a look at the first task. For the first problem there is a dummy policy given that will act um, onto the environment and our task is to evaluate this dummy policy and um, assign values to the states we visit with this dummy policy. The dummy policy is defined by this code cell and um, yeah, how does it work? For a specific set of states we are just um, assigning the action, the corresponding action that has to be performed. So for this set of states we are assigning the action 5 which is encoded according to this diagram. So 5 is here on the east, so this means we are going east or we are going right when we are applying action 5. Then the next action we are performing is action 6 for another set of states. Action 6 means go down to the left. Um, why down to the left? Let's have another look at the course. If we are going right, because that's what the first action was that we are doing, we are going right and then we are going bottom left. Of course we need to go to the bottom because we want to go through this turn, um, but we are also going left because we still have the acceleration uh, or the velocity to the right, so if we are accelerating to the left then we have a zero speed in the x dimension. Um, so that we, after applying this action, we only have a speed into the y direction, um, to the bottom. Applying that same principle, the third action we are performing is going to the top left, which is encoded by action 0, so that we are 
um, actually yeah, going around the corner and um, visit the finish line in the end. The actual task is now to make use of first visit Monte Carlo to evaluate this policy. So let's have a look at the algorithm used for this. The algorithms in this exercise will get a little bit lengthier than in the last exercises. So let's have a look at this one. At first we need to initialize the table where we want to save the values that we are evaluating. And we also need to count how often we visit the, each state within uh, the track course. There are some configuration parameters to this problem solution. Um, the discount factor is given by one. And the number of episodes and the number of steps per episode um, may vary. You can um, try to change them and see if your, uh, if your result differs. But in this uh, example, uh, for this evaluation task, there should not be um, a lot of difference um, for changing the number of steps. Um, however, the number of episodes um, can have a huge uh, difference because we need to have enough uh, ep episodes to evaluate all the steps. For each episode, in order to uh, actually do, um, do our evaluation task, we need to save some data um, that we need to collect within the episode. So we are initializing some uh, some lists and um, for the visitor states, um, we are initializing a set um, to save the data. So after an episode, the states list will, um, will contain a list of tuples, which represent the states that we visited in chronological order. The same um, holds for the rewards list. So the rewards that we collect in chronological order. The visited states will be given by a set because um, a set only holds each element once. So if we are visiting a state the second time, then uh, this doesn't change the set of visited states because we already have that uh, state in the set and lastly, the first visits list will be a list of booleans. Um, so for each state that we visit in chronological order, or for each time step, so to say, uh, that we visit in chron chronological order, we will um, save a truth value, whether this is a first visit to the state, then we um, write true, or it is not a first visit to the state, then we write false. Before the episode is starting, we need to reset the environment. So this reset command um, brings the car back to the starting position and then we can start um, and evaluate uh, the time steps that we allowed to uh, evaluate. The state variables uh, that the track gives us are P for position and V for velocity. Um, and each of them is two dimensional because we have an X and a Y dimension. So we can unpack them into these um, state variables for better uh, visibility. As I said before, we want to save states in uh, form of a list of tuples. So we are putting all these states into a tuple. Um, using tuples instead of lists has um, some advantages concerning uh, list indexing, which we'll be um, dealing with later. Uh, for, for the moment, um, we are putting the states into a tuple and are then able to append this tuple to the list of states uh, that we visited in the past. Then we will check if the momentary state is a first visit or not. For this, we have a look at the first states set and have a look if the state tuple that we just uh, were building here, if the state tuple is already within this visited states. If it is not within the visited states, this will evaluate to true, so that we are appending a true if um, it is actually a first visit and a false if it is not a first visit to the first visit list. Then the momentary state is added to the visited states set. And because it is a, st uh, is a set, the add command will only um, alternate the visited state set if the state tuple is not already within it. Next, we need to choose which action we actually want to perform. 
Therefore, we make use of our policy that we defined in the previous code cell. And here actually you can see an example of why we were using um, tuples of states or why we put the momentary state into a tuple and not into a list. Because now um, we can index this uh, policy. The policy is a list and we can put the tuple as the index of this list. A co similar concept also ex exists for lists where you can put lists as an index, but this is uh, way more complicated and we will not um, be using this um, within this exercise. The action is then performed on the course by evaluating with a um, step function and what we get back from the step function is the new state consisting of position and velocity, a reward for the um, action just performed and a flag whether the course is done or not, so whether we are um, er, whether we arrived at the finish line or not. We also need to collect the rewards so that we can um, make use of them later. Um, so we are appending the momentary reward to the list of rewards and then the episode will be terminated if the done flag was set. So if we reached the finish line we can break and the um, uh, episode is finished or if the done flag is not set we didn't finish um, then the episode goes on. As we did set a time limit for the episode as given here, um, we only have um, a limited number of steps that we are allowed to perform or else uh, the episode will terminate automatically without the done flag being set. Um, so this would be um, another uh, possibility for the, um, for the environment to terminate. This is it concerning the loop that performs the episode but we um, also need to learn from this episode. And as we are doing Monte Carlo learning, the learning step takes place after the episode. So the loop is now over and then we are going into the Monte Carlo learning step. As we are trying to do policy evaluation and not um, control of this environment in this task, the um, Monte Carlo learning step will also revolve around this um, task. So we are trying to learn the value function as can be seen here. And as we were collecting all the data in the episode in beforehand, we now have readily available a list of states, a list of rewards and a list of first visit information whether the um, visit to a specific state was actually the first visit or not. According to the first visit Monte Carlo algorithm, we now need to initialize the return to zero and then go to uh, through all the states um, or go chronologically backwards through the episode. So we are not going uh, from element one to the last element uh, through the states um, list and through the other lists, but we are going backwards, which is indicated by this minus one um, in the index here. The operation that we have to perform in every um, backward step then is this accumulation of the um, return, so we are discounting the return and we are adding the next reward to it. The last part of the algorithm only has to be performed if actually a first visit has uh, taken place. So as we were using the information from this first visit um, list in, uh, from the beginning on, we now just, just have to check if the first visit flag um, here actually um, evaluates to true and if it does um, we will perform these two steps. This step here will count the visits to the state that we are um, currently in. As um, this endict was defined to be a dictionary, uh, we can make use of this um, and make life a little bit easier by using this get function that you can use for dictionaries. What does this mean? So um, we are evaluating the dictionary uh, for the index s. So we use the state as an index again sort of. And um, if we've already been in the state then there is an entry for the state um, that we will um, get back uh, and uh, can make use to calculate. But um, if the entry does not exist, so we are the first time uh, in the state, then we will get back zero because we define uh, this zero here. Consequently we will add one to this number of previous visits 
and then have an updated dictionary. This last command then will update our value estimation for this specific state and uh, what we see here is just the application of the recursively implemented average value. That's it for this algorithm for now. Now we want to see it in application and see whether the results are actually useful for us. Execution of this algorithm shouldn't take that long because the dummy policy will ensure that we are actually arriving at the finish line without wandering around the course arbitrarily. For example, on my machine, it only took one second to evaluate this um, policy. So then let's have a look at the results. We are making use of these um, two functions here. We are plotting this as a text uh, print and as a um, heat map. Both of these depictions now show us the um, value that is um, that has resulted for that specific position. Usually um, the state in this example consists of more than just the position, um, but also consists of the speed. But as the dummy policy didn't really alter the speed very much, we were usually going at one speed um, or the zero speed. Um, these are the two options and um, so we don't really need to um, make uh, strong distinctions between the, the speed dimensions. For simplicity, so that we can put this information into a two-dimensional plot, we are now looking only onto the, into the position uh, dimensions. And as we can see, the lowest values result for the starting line, and as we are moving closer to the finish line, the values are rising. One question asked in this task is, how can we interpret these values? As we get minus one reward for every time step that we need to reach the finish line, we can interpret these values as the time duration that we need to reach the finish line. So for example, for this point on the starting line, um, it evaluates to minus 15. So that means that we will need 15 more time steps uh, until we um, finish the race and um, yeah, reach the goal. And as the starting conditions for this problem are random, um, so we do not know in which of the fields um, on the starting line we will be starting, um, you can see that um, all of them were chosen within our evaluation. So we had episodes where we started on this line and we had episodes where we started on this line and on this line. But uh, all of them have in common that, uh, that the car was turning to, to the right here or uh, driving downwards then. And um, yeah, so we don't have evaluations for this point, for example. As this point and many other of the points available here were never visited by our dummy policy. That's it for task one. Now let's have a look at task number two. In this task we want to implement an on-policy epsilon greedy control algorithm and as epsilon greedy is a stochastic soft policy we need to implement the policy in a little bit different way than we did in task number one. As you can see the policy is saved in form of a five-dimensional list and not in form of a four-dimensional list as in task one. Um, and this is because we uh, need to save the probability of each action and not the action command itself. So the first four dimensions again tell us uh, in which state we are and the fifth dimension tells us which action we are looking at. Um, and then the entry for this index now tells us which probability we are giving to this action. So in this case, for example, action 5 gets probability 1 and action 4 gets probability 0. So then let's have a look at the actual problem solution algorithm. Same as before, we need to initialize some um, storage. Uh, now it is for action values and not for uh, state values. Um, hence the different name and hence we are um, adding another dimensions for the actions that are possible. The actions are here encoded in a two-dimensional way, um, but this is not a must. The configuration parameters um, are given here. Epsilon is set to 0 0.1, but of course you can play around with it and see if better results come out if you um, change it. And of course the number of episodes plays a big role here because if you learn longer um, you can expect better results uh, generally. 
And yeah, the number of steps, uh, we will talk about it later. It was part of the question why we need to limit the number of steps for this um, example. A lot of the actual algorithm is uh, quite similar to task number one, so I don't want to go through uh, everything of it uh, in detail. What is um, what has changed now is that we are implementing a position map so that we can easily plot the trajectory that we were using after the episode. Every time step we are marking our current position on this map so that we can plot it later. Action selection now works a little bit different than in the first task because we implement an epsilon greedy policy. So what happens first is we are getting a random number between 0 and 1. And if this number is larger than our epsilon value that we defined um, in the initialization, then we will act um, greedy with respect to our policy. And as we store probabilities for every action in this policy, we are now taking the argmax to receive the um, action that has the, gotten the highest probability in there. However, if this random number was smaller than the epsilon value we defined, then we will just um, have a random choice of all the possible actions and um, yeah, use this uh, step to explore. Most of the rest stays the same. Um, so let's have a look at the Monte Carlo learning step now. Again, we are going through time uh, in a backwards way in this learning step. We are accumulating returns. We are counting the visits to each, each state. And we are also applying the um, recursive mean value um, to our action value. Please note that it's the action value now and not the state value like in the first task here. The main difference then comes um, here where we will alter the um, alter the policy in order to achieve a better policy policy for the future. As we already changed the action values in the previous step, we can now have a look at the new updated action values and decide which actions um, or which action uh, maximizes this action values. So we are applying the argmax to the action values. We are applying the state dimensions of the state that was currently investigated here and look for uh, another action that could be performed in this state. Then according to epsilon greedy policy, the probabilities for this um, for these actions um, will um, change. So all the actions that are not the argmax uh, will get a new probability of epsilon um, over 9. And the, uh, the action that was evaluated to be the maximum of the um, action value will ev uh, evaluate to this term here. Of course, we will need more than one episode uh, to learn everything about this environment um, because we really need to try all the possible options. As we were initializing the action values with uh, zeros, but we are actually collecting ne negative rewards, um, uh, at first sight it will look like all the other actions um, will be better than negative rewards because the action values for most of the actions will be zero um, and only the action values for actions that I um, have already seen will be negative. So we will need a lot of exploration and wait until all the action values have been evaluated to negative values until actually um, the learning um, starts and uh, we are working on uh, the real values and not on the initialized action values anymore. I've computed this in beforehand, so let's have a look at the results. Um, I, I've uh, done it for 5,000 episodes, um, but it's well possible that you receive good results um, even with less than 1,000 episodes. In the first episode, our dummy policy is still present. So um, we are trying to follow the dummy policy, but of course it can always happen that um, we are um, getting this um, epsilon action where we are trying to explore and tends to something completely different than our dummy policy would suggest. So you can see that here, especially in the beginning, we are not really following the dummy policy, but um, it seems like here the random event um, hit and um, yeah, we were doing something completely um, different than our dummy policy would have uh, suggested. Then here you can, uh, you could expect that this um, could have been our dummy policy in action. Uh, 
and although we used the dummy policy for this first episode we did not really uh, we cannot really be sure that we actually visited the goal line here what you can also see is that all the um, starting uh, all the points on the starting line are not anymore red but now yellow so that means that we have made use of all of these starting points at some point so that means we had at least three collisions with the wall um, where our car was um, set back to the starting point then after the first episode however we are performing these update steps and as we are um, taking the arc max about the action over the action values um, we will now completely forget the dummy policy because we initialize the action values with zero zeros um, but the rewards that we collected among this way uh, were all negative so now we will um, in the next step take a completely different policy because um, yeah the policy that we took uh, as a dummy gave us negative rewards and um, the other action values that are still um, initialized to zero um, yeah they, they promise a, a reward of zero which would of course be better than a negative one of course uh, actual reward of zero is not what we will observe when we are performing the other actions but we have to learn that before we know it so um, we have to let the policy um, do what it wants to do f at first and um, yeah this involves a lot of failing uh, which we will see um, in the consecutive um, episodes so for example here we had a very different policy you don't really recognize any pattern that was present in our dummy policy and uh, yeah uh, it also seems like it was not very useful we were, uh, were obviously colliding uh, with the wall here and then restarted from the starting line this explorative failing will now go on for a lot of other episodes um, some will be more um, successful and some will be less successful but um, for a long time now the finish line will not be um, visited in my example now it took 729 episodes until the goal line was hit with the first try so we see that only this field of the starting line is marked in yellow and the other um, fields are still red so the car was never um, starting from these points and um, accordingly finished the race in one try without collision and we see that this um, policy that was used here is rather different from the dummy policy we used in the beginning and as we wanted it is also a lot faster we see that the car is braking here so that it will not collide with the wall and then going around the corner um, as fast as possible by jumping over one field however this doesn't necessarily mean that this is already the optimal policy it is only the first episode where we had a successful policy let's have a look at um, another example maybe a very interesting example can be seen in this episode um, as you can see it is uh, happened much later than um, the last one i showed so what is interesting about this the policy starting from this point didn't really change um, the form seems to be the same um, the, and the steps and actions that are taken are seem to be equal to the one i showed previously however what is interesting is that this field on the starting position was visited and this field not and then this field was visited again and from here on um, the car started its uh, way so what does it mean um, it seems like the agent actually learned that uh, random placement on the starting line takes place and this could be used um, to our advantage by colliding with the wall exactly in the beginning so if, um, if you are start here and you drive up immediately you are colliding with the wall and you are um, repositioned on the starting line and it could happen that your next position is better than the previous position and it seems like the agent actually learned it that starting here is not so good as starting here or here and so it drove into the wall from this field and then respawned here to go through the parkour from this point on this is a good example how reinforcement learning doesn't always lead to obvious results um, because we didn't actually mean the um, car to collide with the wall 
but in this case it actually was an advantage because um, these were some fields of distance that the car um, just um, passed by colliding with the wall actually. For the last training episode also the policy wasn't changed any further so um, maybe we actually have found the optimal policy um, here um, as given by this trajectory. As action selection in this episode still is based on random number generation, uh, let's have a look at a deterministic example. And as we can see, um, if we are actually um, using the most greedy uh, action, as um, can be seen in this um, row, then um, yeah, the policy doesn't really change. So um, we can expect it to be quite a good policy. However, this was not everything we can say about task number two, as there was um, still this uh, extra question uh, to answer why we need uh, actually a time boundary for the ep uh, episode length. The basic principle of Monte Carlo learning is that learning only happens after the episode is over. So in order to force the learning onto the agent, we need to ensure that episodes are over at some time. This could either happen naturally, in this case by um, finishing the race and um, reaching the goal line, or it could happen by this time limit that we can implement. As we cannot be sure that the policy um, that is learned um, is able to solve the problem in every episode, um, it is a good way of guaranteeing that the episodes are terminating if we implement this time limit. If we wouldn't implement the time limit or if we would raise the time boundary um, to a very high number of time steps, this would lead to the number of um, steps uh, that um, are taken in order to um, go th to the uh, finish line may largely increase. The return, so the accumulated and discounted reward we are collecting along the path, um, is uh, also inflated we will get very large negative numbers in the end. And consequently, as we are trying to act greedy and um, take the best possible action and not the worst possible action, um, these low ratings are not really um, expedient for um, solving this problem. In the third task, we want to implement an off-policy epsilon greedy control algorithm that uses weighted important sampling. Off-policy means that during data acquisition, we will follow a different policy than that one um, that we are learning. So let's have a look at the policy. As you can see, the policy follows in general the same behavior as in task 2, but now we are saving it once as the behavior policy and a second time as the learned policy pi. So what is the difference? The behavior policy will be kept constant during training and this will be used uh, for data acquisition. And the learned policy pi will be trained, uh, of course, during training, but it will not be applied to the system during training. Let's have a look at the main algorithm. Again, we need to initialize action values in the same style um, as we were doing it in task two. As we are using weighted important sampling, we are not counting the pure visits to each state, uh, or state action, but we also um, need to account for the importance weight so that we renamed this. Moreover, now we do not need to save the action states only um, for indexing within the action values, but we will also need to um, use the pure actions for some comparison tasks. We will come to that later again. Data acquisition now works in almost the same manner as before, and the really interesting part now comes in the weighted important sampling update step. For weighted important sampling, we need to initialize this weight value to a value of 1 before the update loop starts. But again, we are going chronologically backwards through our collected data. As you can see here, um, the C dictionary doesn't count the pure visits to the states uh, or to the action states, but um, it accumulates these um, weighting values. Updating the action values and the policy is not so much different uh, from task number two, but um, as you can see here, the learn policy pi only appears in the update step and it didn't appear in the 
um, data acquisition step as here we are we are using the behavior policy to um, collect the data then we need to have a comparison whether the action we actually applied within the um, data collection would have been the same action that our learn policy would have suggested here to simplify this comparison we did collect the action in the other list here if the action that we applied in this um, state is the same as the action that the um, learn policy would have suggested in this state we can expect that the um, behavior policy and the learn policy are sufficiently similar and we can go on with the next um, st um, step through this learning loop before the next run through this loop um, also this wait update uh, must be performed and then the learning loop will continue continue to run until either the um, collected data from the episode is used up or until learning um, learning policy and behavior policy differ so much that um, we need to break um, here after this check so let's have a look at the data collection now as we can see um, Again, in the first episode, we are following the dummy policy, but uh, this time, as we are not altering, altering the behavior policy, also the um, next coming episodes still behave the same because we are still using the behavior policy. And even in the last training episode, we can still clearly see that the behavior policy is used and um, hasn't altered. When looking at this naively, one could expect that we learned a lot more from this behavior policy because we were able to solve the um, uh, solve the environment in almost every single um, training app. However, if we take a look at the validation episodes where we act um, greedily using the learn policy now, we see that the learn policy is not so much different from the behavior policy. As we can see, we are still solving the environment in every episode but we are not really um, better than in task number two. Um, the policy that we learned now is not faster than the policy that we learned in task two. So the question is why has this happened and why didn't we learn more from the behavior policy? As we didn't change the behavior policy during training, the exploration that we can expect to be done here is the same for almost every training episode, of course. Consequently, once we have seen everything that we can um, see with the behavior policy, we cannot expect to gain more knowledge about the environment by still using, using that behavior policy. Accordingly, our learned policy can, can and will not contain so many new elements than um, the elements that were already contained in the behavior policy. And as we are looking at these episodes, these validation episodes here, uh, we can see that only this little step here is um, different um, to the behavior policy and it can be expected this is, that this is only due to the epsilon factor um, hitting and um, yeah, making us uh, use a random action during the training uh, at some point. In order to overcome this problem we would need to change the behavior policy and we can do this in different ways. One possibility would be to alternate the behavior policy once in a while, which is not that easy because um, because you don't always know in beforehand which key elements your behavior policy would need to implement. Another option would be to use the resulting policy from task two. Uh, you could, could call this a pre-learned approach. And yet another option would be to change the behavior policy according to the learned policy but not in real time but with a little delay and you could do it according to this formula formula which uh, implements kind of a low pass filtering um, on the learned policy so that the behavior policy is slowly going towards the learned policy as always feel free to give it a try and if i can't motivate you to do it maybe shia labov can for the end of this video, now let's have a short look at task number four. This task is not as essential as the other tasks before. It was rather made to give a little perspective what may come up in the future lectures. Let's have a look. So the task is to solve a more complicated course like you can see here. We are not performing the U-turn now, but we are performing a full circle. This is by far a more complex um, environment 
because uh, not only the task is uh, more complicated, but also the state space is much larger, so that we need uh, a lot of more exploration in order to gain enough information about all the states. If you try it yourself, be aware that it may take a while to solve this problem, but it's possible and uh, Monte Carlo can do it because the problem description is still the same as before, because the environment itself hasn't changed its rules, only the um, course of this track is a little different and that's, this is what makes it complicated. I've tried to solve this course myself on a more powerful machine than my own. And um, you can see a screenshot of the result here. So I think this is one of the first episodes where already a good policy was learned. And as you can see, it took this computer about six hours to learn this policy. So yeah, it's quite costly in resources. To solve this problem. That's it for this video. Thank you for listening. Take care and stay safe. Cheers.